once my presentation comes up here, it will I will be speaking tonight about uh, Epsilon Origi, uh, one of a uh, variable star in the night sky, and uh, the American Association of Variable Star Astronomy, who are going to be uh, undertaking a long-term measuring campaign of this star. Oh, this is just like speaking to the mic. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so just to recap what I had just said before, because apparently some people did not hear me, um, I'm talking tonight about Epsilon Origi and the uh, long-term, or Origi if you prefer, um, uh, and uh, the long-term uh, observations that are being done right now by the American Association of Variable Star Astronomers. Okay, so that is in fact considered the correct pronunciation, origi. I know it sounds very similar to um, something else. Uh, epsilon, of course, is the Greek letter. Uh, so this is uh, epsilon. This is, of course, the fifth star, the fifth brightest star in the constellation Origa, the chariot here. So here's a star map and a, uh, a um, map from the, an actual photograph. Uh, you can see that this is the bright star Capella. Uh, it's right next to the border with Perseus, and right down here is Epsilon Origi. This is the variable star of interest, and I believe most of these are non-variable stars. So if this star is uh, easy to see, in the night sky, it's very easy to find. Um, any basic uh, star map or uh, that you pick up, or, or planisphere that you pick up at like a science center will have it on it, so it's very easy to find. Uh, this time of year, uh, if you want to have a closer look up, I have an iPod app that will give you uh, its position in the sky on a night-to-night -night basis. Of course, tonight is not great for observing. So, what is a variable star? A variable star is any star that changes its brightness with time, uh, intrinsically. So, we all know that there's dust and clouds and atmospheric effects which cause stars to shimmer or scintillate or generally brighten or dim, but an intrinsic pattern can often be found. So, with, in this case, we have a large red star and a smaller blue star companion. And as time goes on, you can see that it moves in front of and behind this star. So as this small star moves in front of the larger star, it cuts off a tiny little piece of the visible surface of this star. And so you see the brightness dip. Likewise, when it's behind, you miss the light from that smaller star and it also it causes a deeper dip. So how do we classify an eclipsing binary light curve? Uh, anybody here taking Astronomy 101 or Astronomy 205? Okay, a few people. All right, this is great. Uh, I got started off in Astronomy 101 uh, back a decade ago. So this will, we did a lab on this where we used a computer simulator. Uh, so any, any star that has a brightness that varies with time is known as a variable star. Most are close binary systems. Some pulsate, as in Polaris. Uh, the North Star is actually a Cepheid variable and it pulsates. It actually physically gets larger and smaller. And as a result, the light is brighter or dimmer. Okay, a measured light curve for a uh, periodic variable, it can usually be taken in chunks that look like one oscillation and then folded on each other so that you can get uh, you know, a long observing time compressed into a short space on a graph so you can see very clearly what, what's going on. So if you have a cloudy night one night and you miss data, 
And then the star goes around and comes around in, a, in an orbit, and it blocks the light again. You get the same. You, you can fold <coughs> to that period, and you can see, you can complete the area where you have no data, thus making your analysis just that much better. More data is always preferable in science. Uh, and the shape of the light curve will tell you an awful lot about what kind of stars you're dealing with. So, here is a V809 sig, uh, that's in the constellation Cygnus. Just for note, those of you who don't know, a, uh, st a certain pattern, so this nice triangular V-shaped pattern, for instance, would be named after the first star found to have that pattern. So in this case, this is uh, two stars that are uh, one slightly larger than the other, and they are quite far away from each other, so they're not, you're not seeing this kind of hump here. So that means they're far away from each other, and you get a nice sharp dip, which means that uh, they, this is at? a partial eclipse. But I'm not really, I'm not, I don't really understand like, what you're explaining here. Oh, okay. Uh, if you take uh, measurements of the same star night after night after night after night, and it varies, right? You plot brightness on Y and time <coughs> or phase, you know, the, t the, the time that it repeats on X. What are you talking about? Stars. Stars. Larger yeah. stars and smaller stars, one smaller star orbiting the larger star. When they're both in view, it's very bright, as you can see. When one yeah. intercepts the other, then it actually takes away some of the brightness from the larger star. But it still has the combined brightness of the small star, so it's a small dip. However, if it goes behind, the small star goes behind, then you can only see the brightness of, of, the, of the other star, and then it's completely gone. And then that's that other dip. So it's just watching a star. Yeah, you're looking at a star, and, 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 and based on the light coming from it, so figuring out that there are actually two and that they are moving around each other. Yeah, that's basically correct. Okay, we have a question down here. Uh, I understand it, and you're absolutely crystal clear. I, I get you. Please continue. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so the, as you can see, you can tell whether or not the stars are close together <coughs> and deformed into a kind of an egg shape if there's this rounding here. Uh, where there's a flat bottom on the curve, that means that one star is significantly larger than the other, and, or smaller than the other, and it takes time to cross. So what can we learn from eclipsing binary stars? Well, the period, the amount of time it takes the stars to orbit their mutual center of mass. Uh, their, or, their inclination to our line of sight, not all uh, planetary or uh, binary systems will be exactly in line with our with the plane of the sky as we understand it. Some will be flat, flat on like a pancake, some will be edge on. Those are the ones that we get to see. So the inclination is actually a fairly important parameter. Uh, the masses of the two stars. This is, this is the gold mine right here. This is what we're really after. Once we know the mass of a star, and we have a spectrum for it, we can classify it. Once we classify it, we know what its life cycle is going to be, and then we can make predictions about other similar systems that we might be able to find. And the luminosities of the stars. There again, how much light are they putting out? Uh, is star one significantly brighter or less bright than star two? Are they the same physical size and one less bright than the other? This gives us clues about mass, this gives us clues about lifetime, this is, in fact, the most important parameter for the lifetime of any star. So, um, and of course, the radii of the stars, the physical size of the stars. Most stars, when not acted on by gravity, are a perfect sphere, uh, because they are basically gas held by its own gravity. But uh, if you have a star that's stretched or distended or you know, bent by gravity and orbit into a pear-like shape, that'll give you a lot of idea about the relative mass of the companion and sometimes even the age of the star in rare circumstances.
Okay, epsilon origin. Uh, why, how did this mystery come about and what is the mystery of this system? Well, in about 1821, Johann Fritsch uh, first discovered that this star actually dims and brightens and that he classified it uh, as likely a long-term variable star. Uh, re a regular observation uh, campaign was begun in 1842 to 1843 and they noticed that in 1847 for about a year or two years rather, it became quite a bit dimmer. Observations went on into the late 19th century, and there were uh, dimmings again in 1874, 1875, and 1901, 1902. So you can see a pattern developing here. Uh, dimming in 47, dimming in uh, 74, dimming in 1901, 1902. There's a regular pattern here in the dates. So, what is the mystery that we're seeking to solve? Although no one really understood it at the time, this was a long period variable. Up until then, only short period variables were known. Those that went around, those stars that uh, had a period of two or three days, um, Algol, it was a period of three days and a fraction. So that was really the first variable star ever known. Uh, it's in the constellation Perseus. Uh, so this was the first long period found, I believe. And in 28 Harlow Shapley, now, correctly concluded, I'm not exactly convinced on this. Uh, that, that it was an F0 uh, supergiant. That the primary is an F0 supergiant. Uh, Spectra's pretty, you know, th th there's a lot of looseness in the interpretation of the spectra. Um, a, a lot of people saying that, it, that, it, that it's a giant and not a supergiant. So it's luminosity classes, it's in doubt. And I've seen uh, spectral classific classifications uh, from F to the uh, low G range. However, there's no light at all from a known companion, which is weird. Normally, you get to be able to separate, separate out the light of the companion from the eclipse. And if you know when the eclipse is, you can take a spectrum and usually get one star or the other. So there's this massive invisible star just there. It's massive. It has, it's emitting no light of its own. So the first theory published uh, was by Kuiper, Struve, and Stromgren, and anybody who's taken astronomy will know those names. Uh, uh, Kuiper, Kuiper Belt, Struve, Stromgren, they worked in, um, uh, they worked a lot in, on planetary nebulae. Uh, they suggested that it was an F2 star, see, the classification's already changed and uh, that there is a semi-transparent superstellar shell. That's like a shell of material that doesn't emit, emit its own light, but somehow absorbs light. Uh, this idea held sway for a while. Um, they thought it was an atmosphere of a very small star. Some people even put it down to being an early example of a black hole. Okay, so in uh, 65, there were new, um, uh, th there was a paper published by Huang. Uh, I have a book by him, Huang and Yu, on uh, stellar evolution, so he's very well respected. His text on stellar evolution is uh, kind of the standard text for uh, second and third year astronomy students. Uh, so he suggested the idea of an edge on thick disk. So you have a small star in, embedded in a disk. So there's no light coming out from that star, but it's the disk that produces the, uh, the eclipse. And in 71, the a refinement of the model, tweaking the mathematics a bit, gave us uh, a tilted disk with a nice little opening in it, sort of, sort of like a donut. 
All right, so this is an artist's conception of what the Epsilon origin system would look like uh, if you were nearby. So this would be our mystery companion here. We have no idea what's, what's in this. And then this nice orbit, this nice dark <coughs> cloud that obscures the primary star. Now, it should be noted that I went to a conference on this and pretty much uh, at the beginning of the conference, there was a paper delivered where they did an, interferom an interferometric uh, measurement of the star. They, they took various uh, telescopes and tried to produce a picture using uh, interference patterns, and they got almost exactly this. They got this finger-like protrusion through the, through the surface of the F star. This is another uh, mm -hmm. artist's concep conception. This one appeared in uh, Sky and Telescope magazine. Uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it, I know it looks a lot like a UFO. <laughs> uh, this is the area of interest. We don't know exactly what's in here. And this down here is our F star. Okay, so um, I have a partial, <coughs> I have a partial uh, data set from the a last eclipse that I haven't actually, unfortunately, have time to update. I will be able to show you that the whole, uh, the feature produced in the light curve by the whole of the disk. Uh, the, first, the central brightening was first noticed in the 54, 56 eclipse, and it's been growing larger, as far as we can tell. Uh, the time of minimum has been growing. So the disk may be growing, and the overall duration of the eclipse has gotten bigger by 44 days. Now this is a two-year eclipse. The whole eclipse lasts two years. So last eclipse, or the, the eclipse previous to the one in 2009, was 8284. Uh, the duration of minimum was the longest known, and there was the fading, there was the fading and brightening problem. And the F-stars, this indicates that the F-star, the, the companion star, the invisible star, is actually changing in a period of 25 to 30 years, which is astoundingly rapid in astronomical terms. And uh, here you can see that the uh, time of minimum has increased from 313 to 445 days over the last... Uh, century. So you can see that it is, uh, uh, however, the overall eclipse duration has declined. So the uh, edges of the eclipse are getting sharper, steeper. Here. The edges of the eclipse get sharper and steeper. The, these are, this is the 1874-75 data. The 28 to 30 data, the 1956 data, and the 82 to 84 data. You see this nice little bump feature here, and here, and here, and here? Here it's not really all that well resolved because we don't have enough data, but down here, during this campaign, it got extremely well resolved, and here too, that this is actually the best result. That's the effect of the hole in the middle of the disk. That's where the hole is. When this thing passes in front of the F star, we get a tiny little bump more light. And so now we're into the post-eclipse monitoring period, as, it, as we had in 70, in 84, 87. And there are quasi-periodic oscillations that tend to occur. This is normal among stars. Uh, this is stuff like uh, uh, the surface of the star going up and down, kind of star quakes, if you will. Uh, during the 0304 observing season, there was a period change in it. We don't know what's driving that. So this is the Epsilon RG system to scale. So this is the F star. Uh, it, it would take up virtually the entirety of our inner solar system. Everything out to Mars would probably be swallowed up by this. So yeah, it's a really big star. Uh, it, it, it's thought to be a giant or a supergiant. Uh, and out here near the or orbit of what would be Neptune, we get the disk. 
okay, with something in the middle. What's in it? Two stars? Uh, is this a trinary system, in fact? One star here, two stars here. Is there a planet in here, uh, keeping the inner disk night, the inner boundary of a disk nice and sharp, the way that the uh, shepherd moons do for uh, Saturn? This is still an open question. Hmm. Okay, so what are, what's the center of controversy? Well, what's in the center of the disk? We can't see it directly. We've got to sort of piece it together through other observations. Uh, could it be two B-type stars in close orbit? Uh, the, it would account for the mass, right? Uh, but what it wouldn't account for would be the variation of the size of the whole. You don't think you wouldn't normally think that the orbits of two B stars in mutual orbit would vary that quickly, right? Even if there were a large amount of mass transfer between them. And uh, which pair of stars would you know? The two star theory would mean it would be like an egg beater, and it would just chuck out the stuff from the middle, so there'd be stuff flying around, would you be able to see it? Uh, is there a giant planet on the interior of the disk? One or more hot Jupiters? Could there be an entire uh, system of planets there? Uh, anyone familiar with the term hot Jupiters? Or anyone not familiar with the term hot Jupiters in the audience? Okay, a hot Jupiter is a uh, gas giant star, very similar to, or a gas giant planet rather, very similar to Jupiter or Saturn that is in a several day to about a hundred day orbit of its parent star. Some of these have been found, uh, 51 Pegasus is known to be a hot Jupiter. Uh, it was one of the very first planets outside of our solar system ever discovered. The uh, list is now well, well into 700 exoplanets, and a, an appreciable fraction of them, I think 10 to 11 percent, are hot Jupiters. So the, the, these kind of planets uh, either form close to their stars and migrate out, or form farther out and migrate in, or do any one of a number of complicated gravitational interactions. And so if we could pin this down, we'd be able to pin down what kind of gravitational interaction is going on. Uh, is, is it, is the, is the uh, uh, planet unstable? Are, are one or more of the planets unstable and being torn apart? Uh, there's already evidence for one planet that is migrated within the Roche of its primary and is being torn apart as we speak. This could be another case. It's fairly exceptional. There's only one result in 700 known exoplanets. So that's pretty rare. Okay, well, we, this was set up for the International Year of Astronomy, which was three years ago, 2009. Uh, it was supposed to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Galileo using the first telescope for astronomical observations. Uh, it's been, uh, the the uh, observing project was funded by the American Association of Variable Star Observers, and the Citizen Sky Project was set up with them and a grant from the National Science Foundation in the States. And uh, the uh, AAS, the American Astronomical Society. So this is where you can get involved. So citizen scientists are anybody who volunteers their time to observe, collect data, and submit it to the AAVSO website. Uh, the data is proofed by a team of professional astronomers to look for obvious glaring errors, and then it is put up on the website. This data set can then be shared among researchers. Okay, so uh, three years ago, the eclipse began. I haven't had a time. I haven't had time to update this. Unfortunately, this week has been quite hairy. Uh, so there is more information at citizensky.org, and we're asking for more help in understanding this unique star. Uh, now, this is a very bright star. This is a third magnitude star. It can be seen uh, maybe not in the core of Calgary, but certainly up towards the outlying regions. So if you are outside, say, the 73 circle route, you'd be able to see this star. 
Uh, any of you living out in the boonies, you should have no problem finding it. Uh, find, you know, finder charts and all the uh, training and everything you need is provided on the website. So we, uh, so the AAVSO does guide you through the process. So there is a 10-star training program for observers in the northern hemisphere, and I believe there's also one in the southern, written specifically for the southern <coughs> hemisphere as well. So if any of you are taking a vacation south of the equator, you can do this as well. Uh, and you upload your, you can upload your raw data directly there. And you can even get published in a scientific journal as a co-author. What? Hugs. <laughs> so this is the second largest citizen uh, science initiative in the world. I know this says that this is the largest. Uh, the Audubon Society has us beat by a few thousand people. So if we could grow beyond the confines of the Audubon Society and their annual bird count, this would be fantastic. <laughs> it's a lot more fun than counting birds. So if anyone is curious, I would make myself available to run workshops if there is sufficient interest. Uh, there, there are videos of the last two um, presentations that have been put up. Uh, tutorials and training are available. Okay, this just recaps, this is a third magnitude star, easily seen in most major cities. And, you know, you know even with a, uh, you don't even need so much as binoculars to do this. This is a strict, this can be strictly naked eye observing. There's also a method for using, any of you own a uh, DSLR digital camera? Okay, you can actually uh, get reliable photometric measurement out of a DSLR camera. They've posted a way of getting access to free software. You take the picture and then you analyze it on a computer and send the analysis in. Right now, uh, Citizen Sky is in the data analysis section because uh, the primary data gathering has been uh, it has been finished because the eclipse has been over for about a year. And they are still looking for people who are interested in helping to code. Um, they're still looking for coders uh, to help with uh, Java applets that analyze data. All of the, all of the uh, programs and data are available free on the website. Uh, the special uh, AAVSO journal uh, has, was in fact published. Uh, so what we need right now are out of eclipse observations to pin down the quasi-periodic variations of the F star along with uh, spectra. If any of you have access to a halfway decent spectrograph, um, that would be intensely useful pin down the uh, luminosity class of the uh, supposed F star. And there's a regular, there are regular newsletters and there's lots of support. And the chat function on that website kicks ass. I've used it. Okay, so what are the science questions we're trying to answer? First, is the F star really a massive super giant or an early post asymptotic giant branch star? Boring. <laughs> Most of you probably don't even care about that. You're probably after the donut. What's at the center of the donut? Yeah. Mmm, cream filling. Jelly. Jelly, yum. <laughs> Is the disc tilted or warped? Uh, like it. Like, any of you, if you still play vinyl, you, you know what a warp record looks like? We think there's a warp in the disc, we need to prove it. How much mass is in that disc and what's it made of? Certainly it's not blue cheese. Um, th 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 there's a thought that it's a, lo a very large amount, almost a, a, a solar mass worth of asteroid material and dust. Like dust, like the size of dust grains. So that's the current thought. Okay, well, uh, the eclipse began in August 11. It finished 
actually really close to on time. It finished on the on, on December 27th. Uh, sorry, that sorry that that's third that second contact. Minimum and yeah, th this was this was out by only about 10 days for prediction, which is pretty good. Uh, okay, this is a current light curve of the up to the 2009 data. I have one up here. They have Twitter. Yes, it's a star that tweets. Sky and Telescope Magazine is a major sponsor. Oh, that's it. I guess I don't have that. <laughs>